All right, in this video, we're going to be looking at um, energy in cells. We talked a little bit about energy when we looked at with uh, enzymes and how enzymes lower the activation energy of reactions to speed them up. And so we're going to talk about the main two reactions in cells that are involving uh, energy, and that is photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Before we do that, we have to get kind of a primer on energy itself. All right, so all living systems require a constant input of energy. They cannot function without this input of energy. And sunlight is the primary energy input for all living systems. You can see here in this picture, you have light energy being input into you know, a chloroplast. It's not necessarily into the chloroplast, but the chloroplast is where photosynthesis takes place. And so that's where that energy is able to be synthesized into a chemical form. And then in the mitochondria, that chemical form of energy is then broken down and transferred into ATP, which is kind of the cell's energy currency. Autotrophs are able to capture energy from the sun um, or other sources. There's examples of like chemical autotrophs as well, but typically when we're going to refer to this, we will talk about the ones that capture energy from the sun. They're able to transform that energy into a form that is usable by cells. Typically that form is glucose. Heterotrophs have to eat other living things in order to get the energy from them. So you see some pictures of your average heterotrophs, the weasel and the wolf and the, the bear with really sharp ears. And so those are some examples of those things. They have to eat other organisms, even, you know, like the deer elk eats um, grass and grass is a living thing. And so they get their energy directly from that, but the bear might eat the, the deer. So that's, you get the idea there. Um, those energy transfers are not perfect though. They are, um, they have a loss going with them, and we're going to, so we'll look at that. It's called the second law of thermodynamics. And the second, thermal, second law of thermodynamics basically states that in every energy transfer, there's going to be a loss, and that loss is going to be heat. Heat is largely an unusable energy form. What we mean by this is that, um, and what we mean by it, unusable is what it has a high degree of disorder. And the term that we'll use for that is called entropy. And so, um, as entropy builds up, the amount of useful energy will also decrease. And so in biological systems, you know, the sun is very organized energy. Plants are able to capture a portion of that. And then they live their own lives and re release heat for living their lives. And then an animal comes by and eats the plant. And in the process of eating that plant and getting the energy out of that plant, they also create heat. And then the animal that eats that thing, you get the idea that energy is lost a little bit over time. If you, you will see this when we get an ecology with a rule of 10% and that sort of thing. And so there are basically two kinds of reactions that are going on. You have endergonic reactions. This is where the products have more energy in them than the reactants. You can see that here simply. Uh, this is where there's a certain amount of energy put into the system and thus the products have more usable energy or free energy available. An example of this would be photosynthesis. The opposite of this is called an exergonic reaction where you start with more energy than you end with. Cellular respiration is going to be the example that we use here. And these are just two terms that you'll probably see. And so I thought it'd be good to just show you these, these graphs, which are probably the best out there for that. Um, and that brings us to this idea of energy coupling. Um, energy coupling is this idea that um, there's two reactions that kind of feed each other. And so, um, you know, photosynthesis and cellular respiration are a great example of this, just going back here. This, these two reactions are coupled, right? Because there is an input of energy and an output here, but the rest of this stuff, these, these energy or these reactions are coupled, though through each transfer there is a loss of heat. And so another example of that energy coupling is the creation of ATP. And ATP is adenosine triphosphate, and when that third phosphate is put onto this molecule, that requires energy. And so energy has to be put into the system in order to do that. You get energy from eating food, all right? And so then, then you have an ATP. Well, ATP is a, a usable form of energy. It can go out and basically 
turn on a process by um, this third phosphate being stuck on there is almost like a little spring. The little spring is able to kind of fling off and turn a process on. It's a really non-elegant way of saying that, but you get the idea. And when that energy is released, then that phosphate has to be put back on, which requires another input of energy. The, this picture here uses the dead battery and the charged battery to kind of give you an idea. The dead battery represents um, a battery that is at equilibrium. You can think of it that way. There's no movement of particles, whereas the charged battery represents a, a concentration gradient, um, a potential kind of energy that can be used. And that leads us to this last idea of reaction pathways. Um, within chemical pathways in the body, many times the product will just be the reactant of the next reaction. And so you can kind of see here, uh, we're going to be looking at this, particularly with photosynthesis and cellular respiration, as there's one reaction after another, and there's typically an enzyme that is involved in that. We won't need to memorize all of those uh, steps along the way. That can be rather tedious, but we will kind of look at the big picture of that. But the, the point here is that when reactions are strung out like this or coupled in this way, it allows them to be much more efficient.